I'd like to uh, present this uh, spiral staircase as a model of the spiritual journey that includes the paradigm of the divine therapist and suggests how the therapy progresses again from a psychological perspective. So how would we put together a vertical and a horizontal diagram? Well, as far as I can see, it, it might look something like this. Okay, and this would be the moment of conversion from the previous diagram. And, and notice on a spiral staircase, when you go downstairs, whether you use an elevator or the stairs, it's a fairly confining situation, and you lose everything you had on the, on the previous floor. And so this corresponds well to the, to the night of sense. Then there's a kind of plateau, and then uh, when, when the Lord uh, thinks that's long enough, he moves to the next level. Now, uh, the problem with this is that he doesn't always make it clear he's moving to the next level. He just moves. <laughs> and, and, and so many people will say after the night of sense, and still more in the night of spirit, uh, night of spirit God has abandoned me. Uh, and this is especially poignant for those who, who have suffered a lot of rejection in early childhood, because here, now this is the ultimate rejection. I thought God and I were friends on the level of our first conversion. Things went well, and now he seems to have disappeared. He seems to have taken a trip to the farthest end of the universe. When I go to the Blessed Sacrament, he seems to withdraw into the inner recesses with horror. Uh, when I try to talk to him, nothing. there's no response. Uh, my emotions are dead. I can't read. I'm bored to tears. Uh, I have temptations galore. I've recycled all the things I thought had been resolved and when I've made my first conversion and made a good confession, as suggested in the cloud. So everything is falling apart, but the most poignant aspect of, of, of what John of the Cross calls the first night is the sense that God has, has gone away, has left us, or doesn't care anymore. Uh, the friendship has come to an end, in other words, the most wonderful friendship we ever had. And hence, uh, one goes into a mourning period, and this is very characteristic of the night of sense, that one feels the sense of loss and doesn't know what to do about it, and no amount of praying, reading, uh, even liturgy, or, or even ministry does any good. The ministry usually, there are difficulties, it falls apart. Uh, everything goes wrong. Our best friends uh, get into an altercation, and so there are external difficulties on top of the interior sense of, of loneliness or abandonment that occurs there. And, and, uh, and this can last quite a while, actually. And so it's important to realize that this is a part of a process as we showed in the other two diagrams, uh, it's not true that something isn't happening, but that this experience is part of the divine therapy and is necessary to bring us little by little to the full realization of our incredible capacity for evil. The, uh, or I put it, our incredible capacity for weakness and powerlessness. And this can be especially difficult with people with psychological difficulties or problems as they're already suffering from those. And so it needs a delicate discernment to know when someone is both in a depression, for instance, and in, in the night of sense. The difference perhaps is that in the night of sense, and still more in the night of spirit, there is a sense at times, not always, of, of going someplace. In other words, there's a sign of some fruit, like more humility, less judgment of others, uh, a greater love of God, or at least a greater uh, submission to, to God's will in our life, a greater willingness to serve. Whereas in a depression, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just a loss of time. One is paralyzed, one doesn't want to do anything. One wants to sleep all the time. And, and, it, and it doesn't have any relationship to going someplace. Now, it's especially difficult when both are going on at the same time. 
it's important for therapists to recognize that in the night of sense a person is going to be have depressed feelings but they may not be clinically depressed the depressed feelings are automatic because they've lost something that was it's like losing your best friend you it's like losing god you've lost god and all the things that that uh, took you or 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 reinforce that sense of relationship in other words the sense of relating to god happily ceases more or less and so as always happens when you lose something you love you go into a grieving or mourning process and that mourning process looks like a depression but it isn't the reason you go into mourning is an enormous gift the gift of knowledge uh, to be theologically exact which is an infused gift of the spirit that impresses upon you through the intuitive faculties not through reason that god alone can satisfy now now this is a tremendous gift because all the uh, energy centers were rooted in the fact that you thought you could find happiness as a the child in power control symbols in the culture in affection esteem and pleasure or insecurity symbols now you know without it going through a rational process at a deep level that none of those things are going to work and so your hope to find happiness in those things is another cause for grief because now you don't know where you're going to find it but the but the gift of knowledge as it grows gives you a true view of creatures so that you can see there's nothing wrong with creatures it's your attitude towards them that was wrong you wanted to draw out of them a kind of uh, a kind of godlike kind of happiness in, in in actual fact it was idolatry you made these symbols of power or security or affection esteem into substitutes for god now you know that's not going to work and so you're much closer to reality open to reality and it's just a matter of time to finish the grieving process when you begin to see that you're much closer to god than you were before but not through the senses and the imagination so much as through being much closer to him being at the spiritual level of your being where god is much closer although he you haven't reached him yet because beyond the spiritual level is the true self and ultimately the the peak of the spirit or the substance of of our being which is uh, the place where where the divine indwelling is is waiting for us and 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 gently uh, inviting us into that place so the right attitude then when god disappears is not that <laughs> i'm through uh, i'll have to leave this to contemplatives or professional people or as people who have i have a family to raise i have the business to work at and i don't have time for this thing and so i guess it's not for me all that is a lot of baloney <laughs> it, the real fact is that god hasn't gone anywhere he simply went downstairs so he's just as close as ever closer because you're closer to the point where he's most present and so uh, these the these people who've been on the journey a long time should 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 not be surprised if they experience uh, perhaps long periods of god's absence and but but you it's our interpretation of it that it has to be adjusted human nature thinks if 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 your best friend doesn't call you on the phone or write you or visit you anymore that's the end of that relationship not so with god when he doesn't seem to be present in the old ways he's present in a new way that is closer and you have to believe that that's where growth of faith pure faith is so important and so after you've been through a few of these staircases it begins to dawn on you when you found him in a more intimate level again that that this is just a process and that it's nonsense that he, he how could he go away since he's present everywhere he couldn't if he did we just turn into a grief spot so so we we just have to sit there and say i don't know where you've gone but if you keep quiet and this is saint john of the cross's advice for those in the night of sense a passage from discursive meditation to contemplation in the strict sense he simply says well just relax don't do anything 
just wait on God. Just sit there and wait for God in your usual time for prayer. And if you do, you begin, you begin, this is, this is now my interpretation, to hear him uh, rolling over or sneezing or, or blowing his nose or something. There'll be little signs that he's down there. And all you have to do is to be willing to take that transitional period, which takes time. In fact, you don't have to climb downstairs, you just have to be willing to be taken there, almost on an elevator. And then you find that God is there waiting for you with open arms. Now you have a much more spiritual relationship with him in which he's closer morning, noon, and night, and even sleeps with you. He's always your first thought when you wake up in the morning, and he begins to be apparent in the events of daily life and in other people. So that, so that this, it's immensely enriching to submit to this process. Uh, all of our faculties in their relation to God are limited. When we pass beyond the faculties, the ordinary awareness, into the spiritual level of intuition and the will to God, then uh, we begin to, to sense the spiritual presence of God and the divine energy in new ways and the enlightenment, various little kinds of enlightenment in which God shows himself to be present in creatures, in nature, in art, in relationships, in other people. In other words, you're beginning to find God everywhere instead of just in yourself, and, and more everywhere. Now, one of the classical breakthroughs, of course, is the transforming union in which St. John of the Cross says God then always becomes present, not as a particular experience, but as an overall presence all the time. That too goes through some vicissitudes uh, and, and deeper purification, so that at times there may be, one may, may have a period of a few weeks or a few days of, of loss of God or, or, or more, more deeper trials than one has ever had, but they're brief and they don't last long and they always have a tremendous reward when the beloved shows up again. And, and, uh, and this process then of, of further development of the state of transforming union can, uh, can go on, I suppose, for the rest of your life with, with further nuances and, and uh, is, is about as close to heaven as you'll come to uh, with the limitations of this, of this life. Now, a, fast, a very important point to add to this uh, presentation is that every step down is a step up. So there's a corresponding, like a descant, you might say, in music. Every time one is humbled uh, to a new plateau in which one accepts one's limitations with the love of God and finds God's mercy at this new level and at that level and at that level, one also resurrects at the same time. There's an inner resurrection that is, that is co-relative with every humiliation. That's why St. Bernard says the path to humility is humiliation. But it's also the path to divine love. So that at the bottom of this pile, we might say, is, is, is purity of heart, which is what perfect humility is. In other words, the heart referring to our inmost being. Our whole being, therefore, is, is integrated and, and united and, and open to God as a kind of uh, a second nature. So that there's, there's, there's no plans of our own that interfere with God's plans. We may have a few ideas, but they're easy to drop uh, if there's indication that they're not appropriate. But these are, and how do these manifest themselves? These manifest themselves theologically first by the gifts of, of, of the Spirit. Charity, joy, peace, the ones that are listed in Galatians. These begin to appear in, in daily life and in prayer. And after them, after one has gone down through the, uh, the beatitude, uh, through the night of spirit, then the, the, the seven or eight beatitudes begin to emerge, which is, which is the, the fullness of the Christian life. So, so as, as our own ego begins to diminish as a manifestation of ourselves in daily life, uh, 
The new manifestation is the spirit and the beatitudes or the mind of Christ, which is another word for the gifts of the spirit. And, and so this head, heads for purity of love and, and whichever one you want to emphasize, they both terminate in the transforming union, which means that you have finally emptied out all the obstacles from the whole of your life to divine union. <coughs> so that it's in letting go of what shouldn't be there that one finds God. And uh, as we know in, 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 in the Eastern religious, religions, the same intuition is, is some, somehow present, like in, in Zen you wait for the Buddha nature to reveal itself, which is another word for the true self. The Buddha nature is simply uh, the, 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 the divine life that has been given to each of us before it has been uh, manipulated by the process of the development of the separate self sense. So the false self is really an illusion. The unique self is the true self, which is the gifts, the person that God originally intended us to be. And, and this is what is gradually recovered through the divine therapy. Obviously, this, this therapy business needs to be emphasized just a bit in these concluding moments. Uh, as, as, as this spiral staircase continues, you find yourself sometimes in a plateau and sometimes in a transitional period. It doesn't matter. I, I personally hesitate very much to follow too closely the, the traditional stages or ladders of perfection. Like even John of the Cross says, the night of sense, night of spirit are longer or shorter in different people and sometimes are reversed. So they're, they're only guidelines and they can be useful because they give certain signs of these particular states. But it, it seems to me more and more as I, as, I, as I work with people who are advancing in the spiritual journey that, that, that you, you should forget about perfection. Perfection is, a, is, is, a, is almost a neurosis in our culture. It has, has nothing to do with, with the true perfection. Uh, if Jesus said you should be perfect like your heavenly Father, this only means you should love the way he does. It doesn't mean you're going to be, uh, you know, a paragon of piety or something. So perfection is love, and this may mean the love of your own powerlessness or weakness or, or the vices that you can't uh, eradicate. It's you, whoever you are, that God is after and, 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 that, and that God loves. And the acceptance of that is incredibly difficult, apparently. Because of all our cultural conditioning and religious conditioning, we want to be something else or better. And, and God seems to ask us just to be who the hell we are. And, and he can work with that and, 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 and bring that to redemption and to transformation and, and to interior freedom and to true humility and to purity of heart and to, and to purity of love, which is the most important, uh, which is the, the fruit of the Christian life. I don't think higher states of consciousness are the fruit of Christian life. They might accompany it, but the heart of it is, is love and love that is not just some feeling you have, but that manifests itself in, in, in service, in endless service, in the forgetfulness of self, in, in, serving, in serving the needs of, of other people. Because this is really what Jesus did. And in allowing our sufferings, whatever these are, to be joined to Christ and to be redemptive so that a toothache or a sore toe becomes a, a divine manifestation of God's love of the world. And, 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 and so there's, there's no one left out of the, of the redemptive process, because everybody can love and everybody can suffer. And those are the only two conditions for, for saving the world, as far as, as far as I can see. Meanwhile, we do what we can to enter into the divine therapy and, and, it, and see how far it will go. So once you've been through a few of these processes, I, I think you're no longer scared. You, 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 it no longer surprises you, no matter how primitive the emotion uh, like, oh, what a surprise. You, <laughs> welcome it. 
<laughs> it's great to know that, you're, that all these things are possible for us to do. Even the worst of things, I, I don't recommend doing them, but to be aware that, that we, we, we have this healthy dependence. I, granted, there can be a neurotic dependence on God, which is, uh, you know, a kind of dysfunctional projection of a dysfunctional family onto God. But God himself can handle that. If you, we submit to this process, this, this, our, our dysfunctions, our family difficulties, uh, one by one are brought to our attention and we're invited to let go of our attachment or aversion to them. And, and, and perhaps interior freedom is the most important thing. Also, once the bottom of this pile is reached, we're close to it, an interesting thing happens, that the Spirit seems to give us back or to lead us through all the stages of our lives, not chronologically, but, but kind of morally, or you know, so that we, we relive our infancy and, and, and puberty and early adolescence and adult life and midlife crisis and so on. This time, with the Holy Spirit guiding us, so that everything that was of value in each one of those levels, the, the adventurous spirit of the adolescence or the awesome character of the infant discovering new reality, all of these, these wonderful qualities of, of each stage of human nature are recovered and sometimes some of the things we repressed for ascetical reasons we're asked to reevaluate and restore. I mean, we may have abandoned music or beautiful uh, sides uh, or uh, sports or something. Uh, God seems to say, well, take another look at that. And, and he gives us back everything that was good at each stage of our life and it's only what was limiting or distorted by our mistaken value system that uh, is tossed into the rubbish heap. So that everything in human nature becomes transfigured and, and transformed. And, and I, I think of Mary here, our beloved uh, companion, who without whom I couldn't have started contemplative outreach and who's been a great supporter to us all. And she, she sort of developed this welcoming process, which includes every damn thing you could possibly not want. Uh, the, the welcoming, she in her last six or seven months was, you could see her mellowing and, and, and she became really radiant right in front of our eyes. I should have known that she was getting ready for heaven, but it didn't occur to me. I was expecting to die first. I'm <laughs> two years older. And, but, but, but she was so happy, so happy person in the last few months of her life. It just wasn't real, at least for this world. And when she came back from, from her trip to, uh, to Italy, she was just all aglow. And, and I saw her a couple of times at the board meeting. And she, she went into these retreats just gun ho I mean, she was just roaring with energy and enthusiasm and, and joy, which was, which was catching. As one lady said, I never thought uh, I'd see God with a New York accent. <laughs> <laughs> was, but that's the kind of impression she made in, in her last retreat. And as you know, she just, uh, she died. She didn't have time to do anything. She just welcomed and that was it. She got a little too good at welcoming. <laughs> so it never occurred to her to call 911, but, but Bernadette was there. But she is kind of a, a sort of, at this stage in our humble development in contemplative outreach, she represents to me at least a, a, a contemplative layperson who was a marvelous woman, fully alive, fully integrated, full of fun, knew how to dress properly, <laughs> and, and who loved everybody and wanted to share what she had been given, and which she did right up to the last minute. And, uh, and tonight, you, you'll hear our lament, our funeral oration, I guess you'd call it. Uh, nothing can bring her back, but the thought of her is enough to make us happy and to make us think that maybe there's something in this stuff after all. <laughs> Thank you.